But good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Simon Jackman. I'm professor of political science here at the university, and I'm the CEO of the United States Study Center. And of course, like all our events here at the University of Sydney, let me start by acknowledging that the University of Sydney stands on the traditional land of the Gadigal people, part of the Eora Nation of the Greater Sydney Basin, and we respect their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, I've gone back to my California roots tonight, CEO casual, um, cufflinks only on a collar, but <laughs> not quite as well dressed as my... He's, as my, he's East Coast. Uh, well, that's right. You can take <laughs> the part of the uniform. You can take the historian out of Yale, but you can't take the Yale out of the story. And of course, I'm referring to Dr. Charles E. Dell, um, um, who I'm pleased to have with us uh, this year and a half, two years with us um, at, at the U.S. Study Center. As I just mentioned, Charles is a uh, undergraduate and a graduate of, of Yale, uh, a historian by trade, but in that um, American mold. Um, uh, went on to um, teach history uh, to senior naval officers at the uh, Naval War College in Providence, but also, as is the want of, of, um, uh, of academics on that particular career path, spent time in government, uh, worked in the Department of State under Secretary Kerry in the Obama administration. To his left um, is Karana Gergic, who um, is with us at the United States Study Center and also in the Department of Government and International Relations um, uh, here at the University of Sydney. And Garana tonight um, will be giving us a take on how impeachment intersects um, with um, foreign policy concerns and perhaps of particular interest um, um, to Australia. And, and Bruce Wolfe um, um, will be um, giving us a, a perspective, um, drawing on his long days um, as, a, as a staffer um, um, on Capitol Hill. So, so Bruce and, and his wife, uh, Leslie, have, have the uh, really interesting distinction of having worked politics in both Australia and the United States. So it's a tr truly sort of unusual and rare and from our perspective, a valuable combination of experiences um, that Bruce um, brings in general, but particularly to this topic of impeachment as it worked its way through Congress right now. And, and I'll be the clean up hitter. Uh, I'll be giving some perspectives, putting my poli sci professor hat back on, just looking at public opinion around uh, impeachment and the, and the critical role that plays in, in, in driving the politics and, and the outcome and, and, and the consequences uh, of impeachment. Um, um, this is a, a, a great opportunity, uh, just a little bit of background to what we're doing. Four of us from the centre tonight, we thought a uh, slightly less formal, we haven't got a big thumping report to present tonight. We do have a collection of essays from the four of us, uh, plus uh, our non-resident uh, fellow uh, Mia Love, who is now uh, safely back in Utah. Uh, Mia's made a contribution uh, from her perspective as a, as a, as a Republican um, on, on impeachment. But we thought we'd do something a little different with this topic. A, given that it's moving pretty quickly, and hence committing to lengthy scholarly analysis of this would quickly go out of date, potentially, and that we would bring each of us with our scholarly backgrounds to bear a, a perspective. And so those, that collection of essays are all about 1,500 words each. That's up on our website in, in digital form. Um, but we thought we, we've done this in Canberra. We're doing it tonight here in Sydney. For, for, for a lay audience, um, drawing on our expertise, uh, frankly, expertise, to, to, to help Australian audiences just dip below the headlines a little further than, you're, than you might be getting even from a dedicated read of uh, the Australian media. And I, looking around this room, I know many of you are helping yourselves to American media. Um, but nonetheless, even relative to the takes you'll see there, I hope that tonight uh, provides a bit of deeper insight and, and indeed, in, in some cases, really drawing out sort of what, what should Australians be taking away from this process as well. So that's roughly our agenda tonight. It's great to see so many familiar faces here. Uh, some people that have ventured from the CVD that we often venture to you to see you. It's great that you've made the journey out to campus tonight. Thank you so much for that. And, and the running order will be as we've arranged the speakers. Let's start at the very beginning uh, with Charlie, uh, who's going to treat us a little bit to the history and some of the background constitutional origins of it as well. Charlie, about five minutes each, please. 
start your <laughs> clocks. Uh, well, thanks very much, Simon, and thank you so much to all of you for coming out. I think the uh, size uh, of this audience represents the keen interest that we can see on such a fast-moving uh, intersection of so many different issues. So uh, what I thought I would do as a historian is dive right into the history for all of you, uh, starting in Britain in the year 1386. Uh, don't worry, <laughs> I'm going to move very quickly past the ancient history because I have a feeling that the contemporary cases might hold greater interest to all of you. Uh, but what I'd like to do in brief is lay out three different things. Uh, first, discuss the British origins of impeachment to explain how it ended up in the U.S. Constitution in the first place. Uh, second, look at some of the lessons of past presidential precedents. It's a bit of a tongue twister. And then third, uh, lay out some conclusions that I think flow from this that set the stage for my colleagues who are going to discuss the more contemporary nature of this. All right? So fearful of an unlimited, arbitrary, and tyrannical abuse of power by an unprincipled president, the authors of the Constitution decided to give Congress the power to remove a president from office before the end of his term if big if, a sufficient number of Congress people decided that the president had committed treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. That's the exact language from the Constitution. Um, but uh, they needed to do this, uh, and it should be clear that the idea and that exact language started in England. Uh, but as they crossed the Atlantic Ocean, both of those needed to change. Uh, first of all, the English conception was meant to hold royal officials to account, but to not touch the king himself. And so for Americans, they wanted to be able to hold the chief executive to account. But how could you exactly steer that middle course between the abuses or potential abuses of royal tyranny and not weakening your government so much that it would just be chaotic? Now, the answer that they came up was a series of checks and balances between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Second, regular elections that would check and hold the president to account. And third, as a last line of defense, impeachment. Now, what's interesting is the first debate that occurred at the Constitutional Convention was, do you even need impeachment? You have regular elections. Aren't those sufficient to hold the president to account? That view was definitively rejected by the founders. They thought that elections were necessary, but not sufficient to safeguard the country from the potential plunge into an authoritarian regime. So instead, what they came up with was narrowing the scope, because it couldn't be for anything. So they settled on treason, bribery, both clear enough, both outlined explicitly in the Constitution, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, if you look at the Constitutional Convention itself, that third phrase, other high crimes and misdemeanors, was key because they wanted to make sure that it was not just criminal actions that were impeachable offenses. Impeachable offenses were something that they thought would harm the national interest, do injury to the American society, and corrupt and undermine the democratic processes of the new nation. So they settled on impeachment as a tool whereby they could remove a president lest his or her behavior did that and if they were likely to do it again. Okay, so that's the background. Now in the past 230 plus years of American history, the House of Representatives has voted articles of impeachment just 19 times. And only two of those have been for the president. Now the first one occurred in 1868 when Andrew Johnson was impeached for firing a very popular Secretary of Defense. It was called the Secretary of War back then. Now, that was not really the reason, that was just the excuse, because Congress was hunting for a reason to get rid of him, because they did not like him, because he had obstructed their legislative program. And moreover, he had been really obnoxious because he had attacked Congress, he had promoted conspiracy theories, and he was a narcissist. <laughs> now, he was a Democrat as well. And what's interesting was he was acquitted by just one vote, even though there was an overwhelming Republican majority in both the House and Senate. And that set up the president that for the next 100 years, neither policy disagreements nor even an obnoxious person were sufficient grounds for impeachment. Uh, fast forward more than 100 years later, and you get to Richard Nixon, who, of course, resigns before articles of impeachment are voted out 
based on the swirl of investigations coming out of Watergate, right? The breaking into and the bugging of the Democratic headquarters and then the subsequent cover up by the White House. Now, as those investigations intensified, the White House refused to comply with congressional subpoenas. In fact, Richard Nixon labeled the doings of Congress a witch hunt and said that he was the most persecuted president since Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> now, Simon's already alluded to the fact that he's going to talk about public opinion. Public opinion played a huge role in this case, and Nixon himself said that the PR case will proceed and determine the legal case. And he was pressured in this, because once his support collapsed, it did so with astonishing rapidity. Uh, final case, of course, was Bill Clinton's, uh, right, where he was impeached by the House and then acquitted by the Senate. Now, in the course of investigating alleged presidential wrongdoings, Ken Starr, of course, encountered an improper relationship between the president and Monica Lewinsky and the president's attempts to cover that up. Now, the process was seen as highly partisan, so much so that Bill Clinton's ratings actually rose during impeachment, up to 73%, which made conviction and removal from office problematic no matter the facts of the case. Now, it is interesting because he was ultimately acquitted, but I think what the Senate acquitted him on was not what he was charged on. Because the Senate did not adjudicate the case based on whether he had lied, sullied the office, or even acted improperly and obstructed justice in a civil suit. What they adjudicated over was whether or not his conduct had done grievous harm to the nation, undermined the integrity of the democratic processes, and were likely to be repeated if he stayed in office. And an overwhelming majority of the country, and certainly of the Senate, said no. All right, so drawing back, what are the conclusions that we might draw out of this? Uh, first, the Constitution establishes an incredibly high bar for impeachment, and the bar for removal is even higher. That does not render impeachment moot, but it does mean that it's going to be a confluence of factors that determine its outcome between the nature of the charges, how compelling the evidence is, and the broader popularity of the president. Uh, second point, because of the gravity of the charge that is laid against the president, it was intended from the get-go to be both political and public. That means, and this has implications for Australia as well, that during the entirety of the proceedings, and we're not even at the vote yet, the US government's bandwidth is going to shrink and narrow and be consumed by this. Uh, third point, you are unlikely to get an impeachment and certainly a removal from office if it's seen as only based on partisan differences, policy disagreements, or uh, acts that are deemed offensive or even criminal, but not necessarily harmful to the nation or ones that impinge the, impinge the integrity of the democratic process. Now, there's a flip to that. If the, compel if the evidence is seen as compelling, if there's popular outrage, and if there is at least a modicum of bipartisan support, the chances of success go up on that. Uh, fourth, uh, I would note too that because it is highly contested about the nature of what happened and the gravity of the damage that is being done from the get-go, this has always been a deeply partisan and entirely divisive affair. Uh, final point here, uh, that the debate is likely to be predicated about uh, upon which Americans think, and ultimately only 100 Americans in the Senate believe the president has committed political acts that are unallowable within American society. Thanks, Charlie. Garana, um, let you, um, that was a Yale version of five minutes, but. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But, 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 uh, I'll, try, you, I'll try to keep it concise and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, especially thank you for uh, to my some of my former students who I see in the audience. Um, so they haven't been put off by uh, US politics or foreign policy. They keep on coming back for more, even though it's the mid of the exams week. So um, special thanks to oh, you. Wow. Um, I have uh, three points to make because in academia we work on this sort of premise of the Holy Trinity. So um, <laughs> there are 
basically three points that I want to make. Uh, first one that uh, has to do with actually a midterm exam question that students said, and then the other two are kind of more relevant to Trump. So the, that first point is one that um, is really important to understand in the context of this particular uh, impeachment inquiry and then the, the whole process as it develops. And that's the fact that this is a, an impeachment process that's unique in the fact that it's related to uh, a matter that stems from foreign policy. And the reason why, I, and I might just hear my echo, so is that better? Hopefully. Um, so um, the, that first point is really important because um, if you, if there's one thing to know about the way that U.S. foreign policy uh, uh, runs and is made, uh, is the fact that uh, despite the separation of powers and the kind of idea of uh, uh, checks and balances that uh, the three branches of governments have over one another um, in foreign policy. It's been a matter of historical precedence and also the kind of growth of bureaucracy and, and uh, various other factors that have basically made the executive branch uh, holding the upper hand when it comes to uh, making uh, foreign policy and, and decision making uh, there. And uh, by the virtue of this fact, the presidential powers in foreign policy are pretty vast. The president is the chief of the executive branch. Uh, he or she has the power to staff that branch. Uh, he or she uh, has also the power to uh, uh, negotiate treaties, to, to kind of have that first mover advantage when it comes to uh, talking to foreign powers uh, and, and uh, uh, foreign countries in general, and also uh, has the ability to do that with utmost secrecy, uh, unlike the Congress. So the potential for the abuse of power, even if you have uh, the best of people in the White House, is already already kind of baked in in this process by the virtue, as I said, of history and also of the fact that uh, the, the uh, executive branch has developed to this point. And that leads me to my second point, and that's really that point on uh, President Trump's management or mismanagement of foreign policy thus far. So. Um, I would say that there are three important factors, and I, I uh, elaborate on that in that essay, um, that are worth uh, of, of our consideration here. Um, so in terms of staffing, uh, that's number one. Uh, we have seen uh, basically what's been a hollowing out of some of the critical departments uh, within the foreign policy bureaucracy, namely State Department, either by intention or by uh, the will of those people that didn't want to uh, uh, work for President Trump. So a number of positions have actually been uh, having delayed appointments or a number of those that have actually decided not to serve under this administration. So you already have a lot of space, a lot of vacuum for kind of informal channels to develop. And this has been exacerbated actually by the kind of informal uh, policy process that, have, that we've seen uh, emerge as a result of a high turnaround, turnover uh, in terms of staffing. So President Trump has surpassed uh, the uh, turnover of staff in uh, those top uh, positions. Um, he, he has outmatched, outperformed kind of in a negative way uh, all of his predecessors uh, uh, in, the, in the modern era. So you have a number of vacancies. You have a lot of people working in acting positions, again, opening up the space uh, for informal channels to arise. And that's how you have the likes of Rudy Giuliani and his associates uh, inserting themselves in the uh, foreign policy process. And also, this is exacerbated by some of the political appointments that are made that uh, get into the clash with uh, the career officials, again, exemplified in some of those testimonies that we've heard from the likes of uh, former ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, and, and um, the uh, ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sondland. Finally, you have one added uh, a factor in this mismanagement of foreign policy that stems from President Trump 
President Trump's approach to diplomacy and his relations with foreign states. And that has been one that uh, has been highly spontaneous, so governance by Twitter, which leaves a lot of people kind of uh, on the edge of their seats, uh, uh, as well as not just uh, those uh, abroad, but also those that serve uh, in the government. Uh, and that has been also exacerbated by the fact that President Trump has, an, in a number of instances, shown that he is willing to work with those that are willing to flatter and oblige him so one should only think about those state plus visits to China you know the pomp and circumstance in France and so on and so forth to basically signal to the rest of the world that you know if you want to extract uh, favors and if you want to uh, get things that you want you better uh, do it in a way that uh, um, President Trump sees um, kind of as, as uh, flattering or, or uh, obliging so what does this mean um, well I think that the testimony that we've heard from Fiona Hill, who was the director of uh, Russian affairs at the National Security Council that we've heard just last week, uh, has put a real uh, uh, kind of uh, a clear case for us that there were basically two parallel policy processes going on. One was the, the one that was essentially marshaled by career officials who were working uh, to pursue national security in interests and there was the other informal channel that was kind of revolving around what Ju Rudy Giuliani did and some of the uh, people that have been named by by uh, uh, Gordon Sondland in that sort of orbit of pursuing those sort of domestic political errands and this is where the battle will come to uh, when it comes to kind of proceeding with the impeachment in Inquiry and further pushing this, uh, um, probably when not if uh, the uh, House votes for impeachment and that when it gets to the Senate. So, um, what does it, this ultimately mean for foreign policy? Uh, it means certainly much more mess, much more added uncertainty uh, to the already existing uh, uncertainty that was already baked in, and a president that is increasingly going to find himself in a position of scrutiny. Uh, it also sends a pretty clear signal to those that want to deal informally with the United States that they might too become subject of inquiry. Uh, and I'll be happy to uh, elaborate on some of those points in, in terms of foreign policy when we get to Q&A. Thanks, Karana. Congressional Bruce. process? Well, yeah, Bruce said, what are you going to talk about? And, and, and he told me, uh, politics. I went, oh, isn't it, it all, isn't that everything? So we said we, we narrowed it we to narrowed it down. the Congress. But first, it's the uh, eve of Thanksgiving, and tomorrow's Thanksgiving Day, well, which is so. a well, great holiday. And, but I want you to know that the turkey that the president pardoned earlier today, his name wasn't Butter, his name was Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> and that turkey is not going to a farm in Virginia, he's going to the Cayman Islands, that's where it's going. <laughs> um, I want to talk about really why we're here. Uh, because impeachment was dead at the end of July. And uh, just, so is that just three months ago. And why was that? Uh, because the Mueller report ultimately failed on substance, and then there's a political element that didn't get to critical mass, but which has come to critical mass today. Let's go back to Mueller and what he was trying to do. He was looking at two things. Did the president obstruct justice? And was there a criminal conspiracy between the president and his campaign and the Russians? On the latter, he, Mueller just couldn't establish it. And I thought of all the people in the world who could do it, if it did exist, he'd find it. Because he's forensic, respected, long experience, and he just could not put it all together. There were obviously ties between the campaign, and this is why um, Roger Stone is going to go to jail, and WikiLeaks on publishing stolen emails that the Russians hacked into. And Mueller indicted a whole bunch of Russians, Russian intelligence agencies, and other people who um, criminally violated you know, the security of those emails. And that is, those are crimes. So interfering in a, in a US election is a crime. So that was proven, but he could not prove a direct tie between the campaign and the Russians. And in fact, the campaign didn't need to have a direct tie with the Russians. The Russians did it on their own. It was in their obvious self-interest. So there was no critical mass on that. On the issue of obstruction of justice, even though Mueller found 10 instances that he documented where the president or his people, uh, Trump, candidate Trump, or his people or others um, tried to block uh, the Mueller investigation and other judicial remedies, um, he declined because of Justice Department 
guidelines which say you can't indict a sitting president to, uh, to, to take that step. But more importantly, he could not reach a conclusion where, and, and, he, and he was not asked in a hearing, and I don't understand really why this didn't happen in the Judiciary Committee, but it didn't, where a member would say, okay, here are the facts that you laid out, 10 instances of obstruction of justice. You can't indict a sitting president, but if the person who committed those acts was not the President of the United States, would you indict him? That question was not asked, he did not answer that question, and so therefore the obstruction case was not made. So there's the Judiciary Committee, the American people, Mueller, at the end of uh, August, uh, uh, end of July, and that's where that was, nowhere. There was one other thing, though, that was really burning in the Judiciary Committee, and that was the um, stonewalling by the White House of witnesses coming before the committee, in which we see uh, lit played out today, Don McGahn, yesterday, White House counsel, mentioned more than any other person in the Mueller report, um, who was a witness to events that could constitute obstruction of justice. He was subpoenaed. The, uh, the White House defense is, which is now being tested in the courts, we have absolute immunity from any congressional oversight whatsoever. We won't even show up to say we have executive privilege. We're not showing up. And no one has ever asserted, I mean, it's breathtaking. And anyone who's worked in Congress or a parliament and understands what the role of, of, of Congress is, the bread and butter under Article I of the Constitution is to have Congress appropriates the money, it goes to programs, they want to see how it's spent, how people are executing the laws, and so therefore they bring them up to congressional committees to uh, test it. And for them to be told, you cannot do your job, um, th this goes beyond politics and, uh, and it gets to identity. And it gets to whether it violates what the American system is, which is uh, three co-equal branches of government. Here in Australia, Parliament, Westminster system, the parliament is supreme. And the executive, all the members of the executive are members of parliament. In the United States, you have Congress, and then you have the executive branch. There's, the executive branch officials do not serve in Congress. And so to get to, for the, 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 this White House, this president to say, not, my people are not testifying to you, that means Congress can't do its job. That was really bugging them. Uh, we'll come back to that because we're going to see it play out a little bit in, in very short order beginning next week. So Congress was stuck. On the last day of his testimony, Robert Mueller, before the House Intelligence Committee, said the greatest threat to the national security of the United States is if the Russians, is the Russians, and they're trying to interfere in our election, and a foreign power should not interfere in U.S. elections. That was July 24th. On July 25th, the president had a call with the president of Ukraine. And, the, and what did he do in that call with the president of Ukraine? Um, if you read, the president says it's a perfect call. In his mind, I'm sure it's a perfect call. In the mind of most other people, it is not a perfect call. Because what he does is say, they discuss the relationship between the two countries, and he says, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to investigate the Bidens, and Biden is mentioned by name in the, in the, uh, in the call, and I want you to uh, uh, report back, to in investigate corruption involving the Bidens. So you have the President of the United States on a foreign policy issue with Ukraine, trying, asking a foreign government to find dirt on the President's principal political opponent. Why is that explosive? And two reasons. One, a, a whistleblower um, who was privy to information of people who listened to the call uh, decided to test it inside the system as to whether something, he, the news reporting was they were alarmed that this had happened. And so that led to all the series of events that have unfolded. But the, the way I like to explain it to Australian audiences is this. Imagine if President Xi and Prime Minister Morrison were on the phone together and Hong Kong is going on. And President Xi says, I, I know you have issues and human rights concerns in Australia on Hong Kong, but do me a favor, um, don't come down like a ton of bricks on us, we have an important relationship, let's just work through Hong Kong. And, President, and Prime Minister Morrison would say, sure, that's fine, legitimate, let's just work that through, that's diplomacy. But then Morrison would say, by the way, would you do me a favor? Um, there are really strong ties between China and the ALP, and I would like you to find those ties and investigate those ties and bring them forward. And also, I want to know where the money is. If that had happened and that was reported, you tell me, please, as Australians, how long would the Prime Minister stay in his job? And that is why this is so explosive in the United States. So this comes out, and it leads to the investigation in the Intelligence Committee, and it's playing out. Now, at the, at the time that this is unfolding, uh, the question, there, there are two issues, a substantive issue and a political issue. And the political issue for members of Congress is, is this going to backfire on us? 
and uh, should we really pursue, uh, proceed with it because it's just terrible for our um, elections, for the Democratic presidential candidate and so forth. But then the substantive issue is, do we have something that rises to high crimes and misdemeanors, which um, really deserves to be tested as to whether the president is unfit for office? And even though we have an election coming in November, do we have to take steps today in order to remove him from office because he, it is just terrible for American democracy? So that's what they're weighing with. That, that's what they're weighing. And in March, Nancy Pelosi gives an uh, uh, interview to the Washington Post, and she says, the politics are, are I'll, I'll read you her quote. Um, she says that, sorry, she says, uh, impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there's something so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan, I don't think we should go down that path because it divides the country and it's just not worth it. But they are going down that path. And why? Because the charges are so important and because um, uh, th th they think he, he is worth it <laughs> and, and because um, uh, th 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 that it's divisive is not a sufficient condition not to do it because what Trump has done to the Congress as an institution is so important that they feel they need to assert their authority and, and review it. Um, just three other things. Uh, so how does this affect uh, the Congress and where it's going? Uh, the con this Congress has been hyper-partisan. Uh, there were only, uh, there was no Republican voted for the impeachment inquiry and only two Democrats voted against the impeachment inquiry. One uh, is a 30-year veteran from Minnesota, very conservative state, and, and only one new Democrat who had been elected in, Trump, in a Trump district. There were 30 of the, when the House became Democratic, there were 30 seats that they won from Trump districts. Those are the people to keep your eye on. If they've been home over Thanksgiving, the thinking was uh, even th all the hearings that Karana referred to as important and compelling as they were, as support for impeachment was shaky. There was some polling evidence that Simon will discuss as to, whether, as to how strong it was. So it, if those 30 members stay true and want to continue the impeachment, then absolutely the House will impeach. If you hear in the next few days they've come home from their districts and they're concerned about how people are, are reacting and maybe uh, we don't want to move to impeachment, that's when uh, this will become a much closer call than it stands right now. Second, what does it mean for the presidency and for um, the, the balance of power between Republicans and Democrats? As Charlie recounted with um, Bill Clinton, there was a blowback on Republicans who went for Clinton's impeachment. Clinton's popularity rose, and in the midterm elections around the Clinton impeachment, the Republicans lost five seats in the House. And the Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, um, he lost his job in partial consequence to what was going on with impeachment. So the conventional wisdom was impeachment is bad for the party that brings it. And that was scaring Democrats, and that's why Nancy Pelosi said what she said earlier in the year. It's, it's, it's going to hurt us. We shouldn't do it. But if you look a little bit deeper at it, maybe not. Uh, in two, uh, af so after impeachment, Clinton acquitted. What happened? Republicans kept control of the House. Republicans kept control of the Senate. Republicans won the 2000 election and George W. Bush served for two terms. In other words, the party that brought the impeachment that hurt the Republican Party was in power for another eight years. Now, so we'll see, this will be tested as to whether the Democrats benefit or not next time in November. The last thing is, what does this mean for the country? Charlie made an important point after the debacle of Andrew Johnson's impeachment, it wasn't tried again for 100 years. We've had two of the past four presidents now under impeachment. So are, is the United States developing a Westminster culture of kill or be killed and using impeachment almost as a casual weapon in order to take down your opponent because you disagree with where they're going? So if that happens, we're introducing a really profound culture change in American politics. And because of the hyper-partisanship that exists, it really scares me. I don't know. How, when Jerry Ford became president after, on the day after Nixon, when Nixon resigned, Mr. Luz, Dr. Loosley over here will remember this. He said, um, our long national nightmare is over, and he united the country behind him. This is not going to happen. Uh, th the next president comes in and say, our long national nightmare of Donald Trump is over. But I'm telling you, 40 percent of the country isn't going to want to hear that. And, uh, and so that is uh, a shift in our political culture, and we can discuss some of the reasons of that. So that's some of the politics that's going on these days. That's great. Thank you. And great segue for the um, 
see if I can ho hold myself to five minutes. Um, put a little reminder on my wrist here. Um, so that talk about hyperpartisanship is is absolutely spot on. A president may be impeached, um, but won't be removed from office by conviction in a Senate trial unless he has lost the support of most of his own party. Right? And so just to remind everybody about the words here, impeachment is when a majority vote in the House of Representatives, it's kind of like indictment, although this is not a legal process, this is a political process, but the legal analogue would be indictment. The trial part is up in the Senate, and the Constitution mandates that two-thirds of members present and voting um, have to vote for conviction in order for the president to remove from office. That is an extraordinarily high bar that Charlie alluded to. That's the two-thirds vote of the US Senate. So suppose every Democratic senator, and there are 47 of them right now, voted for removal from office. You would need 20 Republicans to come over and vote with them um, um, to do that. And so that's the sense in which, until you lose up to 20 Republican senators are willing to vote for your removal from office. That's, that's how on the nose you have to be among your own party uh, before your, your, a president is going to be removed from office. That's why it's never happened. And B, the one time it looked like it might happen, the president fell on his sword before we could get to that moment. That's the case of Richard Nixon. So um, Jackman's rough game theory of impeachment, the only Senate trials you ever see will be ones where the president is confident he or she will survive, and any president who was not so confident would, would take the Nixon option, uh, and by the way, perhaps securing a pardon on the way out um, as to, to, to go quietly I, I and perhaps I think a little Pence, early. Pence would be agreeable, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what will it take, sir? It <laughs> might be an interesting conversation. Um, so real briefly on the public opinion on this right now, the Nixon and the Clinton cases take place in the modern era. And what do I mean by that? I mean an era in which we have tons of public opinion data giving us a rough proxy, and I would say a very good proxy, for sentiment of how well the president is doing among his own partisans. And so the Gallup organization, every week since about 1945, <laughs> uh, have been asking, uh, do you approve of the way the president is handling his job as president? And they break out those results by uh, the partisan affiliation of the survey respondent. And so the magic number to milk from those data is not the overall approval number, but how, what is the president's approval rating among his fellow partisans? Now, if you look at that number for Richard Nixon, that is in the 80s percent range as it is for most presidents. Their own party likes them a lot, typically. 80s, 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 80s. But in the summer of 1974, as the Watergate hearings really start to get some bite to them, and, and week by week on national television, it was a first for its, for its age, um, where stories about just the incredibly corrupt behavior of that White House and possibly the president himself were being treated to the American public. It was kind of like the, like the cricket in an Australian summer. It was just on all the time. <laughs> Right? You couldn't miss it. And it was, no one had seen this before. The last time there was a TV political moment like that coming off Capitol Hill was probably back in the McCarthy era and was that TV. But anyway, this is, was the age of TV and, and that steady drumbeat that the president is a crook started to take hold. And you can watch Nixon's approval numbers among fellow Republicans start to fall and by the time of the smoking gun tape, which is the final nail in the coffin, Nixon's approval rating among Republicans is at 50%. Right? That's what political death looks like. When you're at 50% approval rating among partisans of your own party, and then along comes this hammer blow, this last cache of uncontrovertible evidence, that's when Barry Goldwater can count the votes and say, sir, I count maybe 10 votes for you if it went to a trial in the Senate. And then Nixon can do the game theory yeah. and says, I have one card left to play here and, and, that's, and fall on your sword. Bill Clinton, on the other hand, is looking at we're learning lots and lots and lots about his bad behavior. And he's watching his approval numbers among Democrats not move at all. The House of Representatives is held by Republicans. A majority vote there, in 
votes for impeachment, but up at the trial in the Senate, it was not even close. And, and so Clinton could, could say, bring it on. And he did, and, the Repub and his numbers actually went up through the process. Um, um, Trump, Trump is an extraordinary president in the following, in many regards, but in this regard, um, not only is his approval among Republicans high, it is almost at record highs, has been that way since day one and has barely moved. It's, it, most days it's about 88, flirting with 90% approval rating with partisans of his own party, with fellow Republicans, and, and has not moved. It's essentially a flat line. Among Democrats, it's about 5%. Right? He is the most polarizing president in that regard that we have data on, but also enjoys essentially record high ratings among, um, his, among partisans of the same party as, as, as the president. And that, that is a cause of the fact that what does President Trump do every weekend? He gets on Air Force One, he flies to a red state and does a rally for 20,000 people making America great again because that is his political backstop. That high rate of approval among the Republican base knows that, and by the way, the political carcass of Jeff Flake, um, a Republican uh, senator from Arizona who, who dared cross him, he can point to that, his political capital with the base, as a signal to Republican senators, you cross me, it'll be the last vote you ever cast, so make it a good one. And, and, and that's why he, he, he is just faces no danger at all, in my view, um, if, as I think will happen, there will be a trial in the Senate. Democrats know this. They can read the opinion polls as well as anybody, so what are they doing? I think Bruce made the case pretty well for that. Pelosi was dragged kicking and screaming to impeachment, and I think, frankly, it was probably either she brings it on or her leadership could well have been at stake. Such was the appetite for it among the Democratic base. And you may have a different view. She would never let that happen. That's why she's there. Right. And so, hence, she brings on impeachment. But not only bringing on impeachment, knowing that a public opinion has got to a point where there's more upside for this, not just me personally in terms of my survival as speaker, but for the party. And that's where I th thought Bruce's comments left us at a really de you know, um, delicious sort of political moment to contemplate. This will be a hard vote for some Republican senators. Right? And, and, and Democrats would love to sort of move the chess pieces to put them under that sort of political pressure going to, into an election year. They will have to vote to acquit. Right, to acquit the president of the high crimes and misdemeanors, that the, the case for which is being laid out. And that may or may not come back to haunt them not so long from now. They'll, it'll help them with their primary battle to get the nomination, get back on the ballot paper. But then in the general election, particularly in some of those states, um, where battleground states, um, that'll, that'll, be a difficult, that'll be a difficult race. And thinking through the politics of this, it, it perhaps helps Democrats in their quest to perhaps take back the Senate um, in November of 2020, but it also does damage President Trump and, above all, rev up the Democratic base, right? And as, as part of the politics of this too. Um, but, but you know, the, the, the bottom line here, I think, is we, we don't expect, uh, do expect impeachment, although your line about keeping an eye on those Trump district, I think that's, that's really, I thought, very insightful. Um, we will, we will um, um, I think, expect a reasonably quick Senate trial if and when it gets there. I think that get this out of the way and let the Democrats get back to competing for the presidential nomination, um, probably in their interest as well that that happened. Um, and and I, I just want to end, though, with one observation, and that is, why is this not 1974? How is it that Richard Nixon could be outed as a crook but public opinion is not moving in 2019. And there I, I, I go back to the state of the media landscape in the United States, this time around compared with 1974. In 1974, Walter Cronkite could sternly intone on the six o'clock news the drama of the day as, it, as, the, as the facts were piling up. And people would listen to that and, and Walter Cronkite would basically was slowly but surely informing, and, and his fellow anchors on other networks were slowly informing the American people that the president of the United States was a crook. We are in an altogether different media environment now, where there is less of that voice of neutrality 
up the middle standard reporting, media numbers are now have, have polarized as well. And just to tease some work that we'll be releasing in the next week or two, um, we did a poll in both Australia and the United States, and we measured umpteen things and sideways about people in both countries. One thing we're able to do is place people on a left-right ideological scale, and then we were able to chunk them out by what media they watch. And in the United States, you've got the Fox audience, and you've got the MSNBC audience, and you've got the New York Times and the Washington Post, and you've got CNN about here. But the, like so many things in American public opinion the, these days, the polarization is profound. If I were to sort of wave my hands and draw for you the same graph for Australia, it looks much more like this, right? The people um, watching uh, perhaps this media outlet <laughs> um, don't, look, eight, don't look that particularly different relatively speaking, from a lot of their fellow Australians. Um, we have nowhere near the same degree of polarisation with respect to media consumption and, and media channels um, uh, in Australia than as we do in the United States. And that ability to plug into a media environment where you might actually have your mind changed about the matter, that's one of the factors, and I think perhaps one of the big factors as to why 2019 mm. is so different to 1974, the gravity of the underlying facts notwithstanding, and that's more than five minutes from me. At this point, we'd really like to open it up to Q&A. We have some microphones, and unlike us, questions, not speeches, please. <laughs> Um, and and, um, and I, I've denied you the pleasures of asking a question. No, 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 T Tony, we'll get you out of the way, mate. <laughs> since I, since I've, I've, I've said no okay. at, at the last couple of events, but, but, you. um, but you're welcome. Uh, no speeches, but could you, um, if I understand correctly, the Chief Justice in the Senate trial asks the questions. Can any senators ask questions? Charlie. Point number two. Um, what's the, um, particularly for Bruce and, and Charles, what's the effect? I'm running a campaign, I want to go off, and people have talked about hopping on the plane and doing a campaign event in the evening and flying back for the Senate. How long will the Senate sit during the trial? And how does it tie in with Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, slash South Carolina? Okay. Um, and secondly, on Planet America, people ask quite rightly, why someone like Cory Booker has got zero traction. We know Kamala Harris's campaign has been a complete flop. You're double pa dipping there, Tony. Perhaps you'd like to explore that. <laughs> Charlie, first on the rules. Sure, uh, on the rules. Um, slight correction. So in the Constitution, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States presides. That's all it says. So what he does, other than perform a ceremonial role, is unknown, one. Two, precedent, historical precedent, has relegated the Chief Justice to nothing other than ceremonial presiding. Uh, so presides, sits there occasionally. Questions might be referred to the Chief Justice in terms of process and procedure. But this is the critical point. Because it is a political trial, the Senate sits as both judge and jury and determines the rules and the standards and the standards of evidence. It's up to them and it's by, done by majority vote. So a while ago, about a month ago, uh, there was talk by Lindsey Graham that we're going to dismiss this immediately. And then someone said, well, if they hand it over to Chief Justice John Roberts, who was a Bush-appointed Republican, he's going to dismiss it. That's not how it works. Yeah. It's up to the Senate itself. Um, the only other point that I would make in terms of how long it is, uh, you heard maybe quick, I've now heard some Republicans saying maybe long to increase the pain factor for the Democrats who are campaigning, uh, but that is up to the Senate itself for how long it decides uh, it will take. As far as the uh, senators that you mentioned are concerned, Cory Booker and uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Cory Booker is actually performing quite well, but he's not getting traction. She's not performing well, and she's not getting traction. But the key thing that Democrats are looking at, more than ideology of, of having a candidate with my particular policy values, is will the nominee beat Trump? And that's the primary motivator right now. Now, how the trial intersects with the primaries, um, the Iowa caucus is February 3rd. New Hampshire is a week later. 
Nevada is uh, uh, slightly after that, and then South Carolina at the end of the month. So February four early primaries. Uh, and, and so the pain factor comes into, into play as far as keeping those senators at their desks and only you know, flying at night to uh, do events until this trial is over. I, I, I would think the trial would be somewhere between three and four weeks. So what's Michael Bloomberg's? Oh. Well, thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're filibustering. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, in 2016, Mitt Romney gave what I thought was a pretty compelling, uh, frankly, indictment of the current president. Where, where are those voices today within the Republican Party? They're outside of the. They're outside of power. <laughs> That's where they are. And Romney is as um, he started his. When he, on the eve of his taking office, he did an op-ed in the Washington Post, and it was a pretty strong op-ed to that we, President Trump has some issues that he has to face. But uh, you, you want to talk more of Republican solidarity and intimidate uh, people are afraid to talk out. Trump goes into when Trump goes into a state and endorses you, you generally win. That what's interesting is in Kentucky, and in uh, Miss. Uh, this Louisiana. Louisiana. And Alabama. And Alabama. He endorsed uh, some candidates and they lost. And so uh, there is in the back of their mind is the magic a little bit gone as far as uh, Trump's uh, power to uh, bring Republicans to support the, the Trumpians that he wants to see. His, his power, um, the, I, I keep coming back to the Jeff Flake example. For, for an incumbent senator to lose their own primary, what? Like, that's not supposed to happen. And for the incumbent president to come and, and get behind your primary opponent, when, you know, um, just remarkable. Um, and, and there's Jeff Flake, not an old man, um, but out of politics, at least for the time being, coming to Australia as a guest of the United States Study Center uh, in January, happy to announce. Uh, yeah. Don't, don't go to the beach. He'll be here before Australia Day, uh, uh, so, so mid-January, I'm afraid. Um, but it will be a very interesting time in American politics, nonetheless. Um, but um, I keep coming back to the flake example um, of, and, and just, just there's exhibit A of what happens if you cross me. Uh, and by the way, have you seen my approval numbers among people that vote in your primary? Um, and, and I just think it's, it's just terror. Um, of, of what might happen to them if, if, if they get out of line. To the point where I wonder if at trial in the Senate there'll even be a single Republican vote for, for conviction. Uh, maybe Romney, maybe one of the main senators. Yes, but I think going back to something Charlie said earlier, I think a lot of these senators will say, what you did, President Trump was wrong, we disagree with it, bad judgment, poor, but it doesn't rise to us removing you from office right now. We're having an election in November, and they can rationalize their position inside the party and their future that way. That's right. And maybe just a quick add to where those voices of dissent in the House of Reps. We've seen now a number of Senate, oh, sorry, a number of representatives that won't be running for re-election. Yes. So record numbers of those. So they're voting with their feet, basically, um, uh, rather than uh, opposing the president. So that's also something. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my question's, uh, I guess, uh, historical and maybe constitutional. Uh, pardon my ignorance. Uh, has there ever been a case uh, of an American politician who has either been accused of or held to account for uh, conspiracy with a foreign government against uh, the democratic system uh, of their own country? And as a subset of that question, what is the meaning, if any, in the Constitution, if it exists, of the notion of treason? Uh, great questions. Uh, so the answer is yes, and there's an explicit definition. Uh, so the most sensational case of all was when the sitting vice president committed treason. Uh, his name was Aaron Burr. You've probably heard of him. Um, there have been cases uh, that this happened. They're rare. However, in the Constitution, bribery is not defined, but there's a common legal definition. Right, that you expect to get something in return for what you have done. Treason, though, is explicitly defined in the Constitution and is defined as, I'm going to paraphrase here, you can look it up and see where I got it wrong, um, that someone who gives aid or comfort mm. to the nation's enemies while at war. Now, there's a lot that's debatable actually within that 
about whether or not the United States is in war currently with Russia or whether or not it was in 2016. There's a good argument to be had on both sides of the ledger. Uh, but treason, that's what it is. Side historical point, one of the ways that impeachment transformed itself from the original British intent to the American intent was that impeachment carried punishment with it in the British practice, up to and including execution. This was debated during the Constitutional Convention and they explicitly ruled that out. Impeachment and removal from office was not meant to be punishment. It was meant to be a safety valve and prevention from that same act from happening again. The only other vice president who used a firearm in an official act was Dick Cheney in Texas. <laughs> and, and just to hit Charlie's point, um, um, impeachment is not punishment. Um, I, I, you can be, after you leave, if you are removed from office, you are still subject to criminal liability for those same acts, right? It's not a double jeopardy situation at all. Um, because there's this express sort of understanding about impeachment as getting you the hell away from the levers of power. Um, um, the criminal uh, remedy of that or prosecution of that may or may not come later. Yeah. One other thing, a civics lesson, uh, the House Judiciary Committee next Wednesday will hold a hearing of constitutional scholars on the meaning of impeachment and what the standards are and should be. And there will be, the, the president's attorneys can call their witnesses to hear, so you'll hear divided views. But hopefully that will educate people as to why what is occurring is occurring. We're up there. Thank you. Continuing sort of on the theme of intimidation and kind of linking it to something that was touched on earlier being Trump's sort of media activity and also Twitter activity. Um, I know there's a lot of debate around, you know, are they just tweets? Are they something more? What impact do you think that his activity on that platform or other platforms um, will have on this process, I guess, both on the level of witnesses, but also the Republicans as well? Um, I, think he, I think he uses it relentlessly to cement his uh, base of support and that they're highly responsive to it. And then he also, it also educates other media and you know, all of us who pay attention. This is what he's thinking, and so then you figure out where he's going to go with it. Uh, it is an extraordinarily powerful weapon. It's never uh, Obama. You know, Obama was the first president to use Twitter, and it was very effective for him. Trump has taken it to a completely new level, and uh, it's a potent um, uh, weapon. In a, in a 24-hour news cycle, too, it's just a constant stream of things to talk about. It's a two-hour news cycle. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it makes it a as Bruce just said, it's a, it makes it a two-hour news cycle, or, or even shorter given the frequency of the tweets. But it, it's just, we'll be writing about this for a long time, the way, you know, Trump has used that to completely do an end run around the usual agenda setting and gatekeeping um, lanes in, in shaping well, the There's a foreign opinion. policy piece too, maybe, when it, because he can change the subject immediately from the domestic to the foreign. Exactly what I wanted to Thank say you. in terms of the agenda setting power, that one thing that I don't think we, any of us have figured it, figured it out, let alone um, just, you know, the prime kind of media outlets is uh, the ability of each of those tweets to be yet another bright and shiny object that they're going to chase and so much so that this is actually something that then gets fed into some of those hearings as well, you know, so it becomes, even though he's not in, in that room, he's able to insert them, insert himself uh, into those conversations. And despite uh, many of the, the kind of post-mortems and, and soul-searching after the 2016 campaign where a lot of the kind of uh, prime media outlets have been saying, you know, we need to be smart about the way that we cover this. Uh, inevitably, all of those headlines and, and all of that coverage is and can get derailed by a single tweet uh, from the president. And that's certainly uh, nothing that's going to di disappear anytime soon. Um, if anything, it, it might just get amplified. Steven. Comrade Loosely is keen to ask a question. Thank you, Professor Jackman. I wanted to come to the polling data. And we have focused on the Democratic base and the Republican base, but independents are going to determine the 
uh, election. And in terms of the base, it's instructive to recall that in 1954, the Army McCarthy hearings were being televised, even after the Senate had uh, censured McCarthy, one third of Americans in the Republican base still sided with him. A quite extraordinary figure, and it's, it's, it's not dissimilar to uh, what's happened with Trump. In terms of the impact of impeachment, though, there's no question that that broke Andrew Johnson. There's no question that impeachment broke Richard Nixon when Hugh Scott and Barry Goldwater turned up and said, it's all over, Mr. President. In terms of uh, Bruce's outline of what happened in 2000 and beyond, there's no question that the impeachment process with respect to Bill Clinton did the Democrats damage as well. There's a feature in our politics, in Australian politics, which is called being found not guilty once too often. And I'm just wondering with Trump, <clears throat> yes, the, uh, the probability is an impeachment uh, a resolution, the probability is an acquittal in the Senate. But what happens after that right. in terms of independent uh, voters, not particularly uh, aligned, just growing tired of Trump? Because we can be certain that another scandal is coming. It's probably going to revolve around Rudy, Rudy Giuliani, which, which, as Charlie knows better than I do, the Logan Act forbids individual Americans from making foreign policy where there's a dispute between the United States and another country. So one can see the huge target being painted on Giuliani, whom Trump has just thrown under a bus. So I'm thinking, post the acquittal, what's the shape of American politics in terms of the way the middle ground sees him? Two, two quickies. <clears throat> that is the issue. Is Trump stronger or weaker after impeachment? And then whether can the Democrats capitalize on a weakened president depends on who they nominate. And, you know, most Democrats feel, most Democrats are not of the left, they're of the center, and they feel if you nominate Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, it's a suicide pact for the Democratic Party. And, um, and that is a real political challenge for them to meet this moment with the best they have. Um, I, I think that's, that's why they brought it on. I mean, my earlier observation about weakening making it a hard vote for Republican senators, but, but, to, but to damage <coughs> Trump um, in, in, the, in, the, in the eyes of the, of the general electorate. Um, one thing I would say, though, um, and I've been quoting this, you know, I'm sure many of you American politics tragics are aware of this uh, New York Times Siena poll, about 7,000 respondents through about five or six battleground states. That was fielded post whistleblower, right. shall we say. Um, not post the last, no, not, it's now a month, six weeks old, and okay. But, but in that polling, uh, Biden was the only Democrat reliably uh, beating Trump in head-to-head -head matchups across those, uh, those swing states. Uh, Warren was being reliably beaten four, four times out of six, say, um, by Trump. Um, and, and, you know, we go back to something, you know, I don't want the night to end without this observation about, about the meta arc here. We're talking about the motivations inside each party. But, but Biden has been wounded by this. Um, Biden's poll numbers mid-summer, um, where Bruce could, can rightly say the Democrats are motivated by someone electable, and I think that is code for go with Biden. Um, um, that is no long. I don't know. You can call Biden the front runner anyway. I don't think that's been true. There is no front runner. Uh, okay. Um, I'd probably say Warren, but but um, but only probably. Um, but it ain't Biden that's right. anymore. And I think it, you would have said it, it was. And in that sense, the ruse has kind of worked to, to some extent um, um, it, um, to wound Biden. Um, to raise the, the probability that he gets to run against someone further to the left than the general, and knowing that he could probably get away with it, um, knowing that he lives in this polarized political environment where removal from office is, is just a, an extremely low probability event. And I, I think it's important for people not to lose, as we're looking, someone said this and this testimony, and the, you know, and meanwhile there's this bigger game at, afoot one in which I think, yes, Trump may be weakened, and I think that's the counter-reaction, but, but the first move in the game was, was to wound Biden 
Uh, and it has. A, a super conspiracy theory is that Trump actually did want to wound Biden in order to run against Warren. Honestly, this is how some people think. Exactly the same way Richard Nixon was and not, did not be Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Counterpoint. Okay. Good. <laughs> Just to, to chew on. Save us from ourselves. So please. who was the front runner who everyone was sure was going to be the Democratic nominee in summer of 2007? Uh, Hillary. Hillary Clinton. And then there was a Democratic primary that lasted for a very long time, all the way through June, if not July, of 2008. Oh, right, yeah. So again, uh, I'm not disputing the findings of the polling, uh, and you might want to draw the inference that if you look at the timelines, that's with all of this erupting. But there's another conclusion that you could draw, which is Democratic primary voters have been watching the primaries themselves and have watched candidates, and a theoretical candidate, who is a very attractive centrist candidate, when he's up on stage being roughed up by his fellow Democrats, yeah. might lose some altitude while others become more attractive. It's a good point. I remember I lost $20 betting on Mario Cuomo. Um, to, be, uh, <laughs> never uh, to, to, be the, to be the nominee in 92. You can't uh, bet on uh, Hamlet. Uh, you uh, just <laughs> cannot bet on Hamlet. Um, after Trump, how will the Republican Party resurrect itself? Will it be led by another Trump-like character, or will it return to uh, traditional conservative values, like uh, with a, a Kasich or a uh, Romney? And where will Trump's base, the 40% of white, uh, working class, non-college educated Christians go? Great question. Um, so one thought uh, for you on that. In American politics, uh, and in American presidential politics, you are deemed a success or failure solely based on whether or not you win two terms. So I think in order to answer your question, it depends, assuming that Trump survives impeachment, let's go with the assumption that he survives it, whether or not he wins the general election in 2020. If he wins the general election in 2020, what comes after Trump will look an awful lot like Trump. If he loses the general election, I think you will find approximately 5,000 authors who claim that they were anonymous. Otherwise known as every Republican will denounce Trump as quickly as they could and that they were all working behind the scenes. So the future of the Republican Party, despite some of the big polls that you've alluded to uh, as well, I think at the top and at the leadership level will be predicated about whether or not Trump is seen as being successful as marked by whether or not he's reelected. No, that's, that's, he's, Charlie's exactly Let, right. Let's, yeah, let's, let's, we're, time is starting to wind down and let's try and, yeah, quick rapid fire at this point, I think. Okay, yep. um, unfortunately I wasn't around in Andrew Johnson's time, so can you explain to me just the mechanics, so what will the charge be Oh. How will the testimony be given? Will Trump have to be there every day? Oh, very good. And the last part is, if Trump decides to make this political and all about the deep state, he should keep it going for months if he's going to play that game that you're referring to with the Democrats there. There will be at least two articles of impeachment and maybe a third that I've suggested and some people are thinking about it. The first will be on uh, bribery or uh, that... Um, undue influence was brought to bear on a foreign leader for a personal political benefit. The other will be obstruction of Congress. All these witnesses who have not testified and getting back to members of Congress and feeling a, 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 the imperative of doing their job, they will hold him responsible. That's why Trump's withholding all, uh, witnesses has really hurt him. He hasn't had his champions testify in the, before to make the case. And so the, the Democrats are saying, you're not testifying, we're going to uh, have an article of impeachment uh, on obstruction of Congress. And the third charge, because you have the bribery thing and obstruction of Congress, but there's this whole shadow foreign policy that, was run, that has been run by Rudy Giuliani, and I think there's a case for malfeasance of, gov of, go of government. In other words, a maladministration of office, allowing the corruption of the normal processes of government to occur, and that that is also an impeachable offense and would be a high crime. So I think those are, so at least the first two, maybe the third, and we're going to hear more from that, uh, on that from the Judiciary Committee within the next two weeks. Um, there was a, Clinton had a trial, 
but did not attend in person, was not called, um, and I think stayed down the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue for the duration. You know, call me when it's over. Um, again, so confident in the result. I want to ask, I want to ask Trump, do you think Trump will want to testify in the Senate? Oh. <laughs> I think he'll be testifying consistently through Twitter. Yeah. Okay, let's get a few more questions in before we end for the evening. Thank um, you. Which are the Republican senators to watch? And as, are there any facts that have come to light in the House that might have more resonance in a trial setting in the Senate? Uh, senators to watch, uh, Cory Gardner in uh, Colorado, uh, Susan Collins in Maine. But there are some Democrats to watch, uh, yes. Peters in Michigan, uh, Doug Jones in Alabama. Yeah. So you... Uh, Mike in uh, West Virginia. Uh, yeah, uh, no, he was, he was just uh, re-elected, I think. Uh, uh, he's, okay. but in any event, it's not all on the Republicans that are vulnerable. There are Democrats in which there could be blowback in red states. So uh, that's why I think the net change, I don't think the House will lose control unless these 30 Democrats in Trump districts uh, really just change, say this is too much for me. And I don't think the Senate necessarily will change either. Can I, I can't counterpoint again? Uh, not a counterpoint because <laughs> you just name people. Um, but uh, Simon and I disagreed on this when we were chatting about this the other day. Um, so what other factors you would ask might tip this? And I would just note that there was intransigence uh, against anything but you have to look for the timeline and the confluence of events. So it was not only what was happening with the whistleblower case, but it was the simultaneous invitation by Trump of the leaders of the G8 to the Trump estates down in Florida, which began to move the dial on the Republicans about saying this is unsat, combined with the green lighting of Turkey to invade Syria and commit mass atrocities on Trump's watch. Those all happened, by the way, within about three days. And so I would just note, you have another event that's happening with Trump's pardoning of multiple members of the US military who have been indicted under the uh, criminal justice, uh, military criminal justice. There, there will be more things, as you have alluded to. I don't know whether or not any of those would tip that, but some of those begin to move the dial on the personal calculus of some of the senators. All right, we started three minutes late, so we're gonna squeeze in one more, and this will be the last question for the evening. Thank you. Well, we Thank you very much. We need two more. Bruce says two more. Two more. Um, from my perspective as an Australian, I'm not so concerned about whether Trump does or doesn't get impeached as to whether Trump continues to ruin life for everybody around the world by being re-elected. That, to me, is a much more urgent thing. And the statistics that you gave about the his sort of voters who, who won't abandon him, whatever he does, I'm just wondering, do you have any idea of any vulnerability that might appear that would persuade these people that he's not for them? He, he hasn't delivered on what, they, what he promised them, but they don't seem to have noticed that. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, or, you know, whether there's anything that anyone can conceive of that, or, that could even be um, brought about to make these people actually fall away from him. Yeah, maybe in case of a major economic crisis, which would then hurt the rest of the world even more, added to everything that you've just listed. I mean, that's the only kind of conventional wisdom that we've seen, like, really tried and tested, that if things start going pear-shaped in the economy, the incumbent, the incumbent's like, likelihood of re-election starts uh, diminishing. But failing that, it's really hard to see how, what, what else it would be that, you know, would take all of these uh, uh, senators to switch sides, particularly given the fact that some of them are way less popular than president uh, among their own constituents, so. Last question. This is our last question, so. Yes. Bruce, no, was, you're directing traffic on this, this one, one, buddy. This one here <laughs> to ask, uh, ask a question. What is the probability that Trump's tax returns will be released before he's impeached? Uh, negative 100. Sure. Yeah. Sorry? Negative 100. Well, well, well no, 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 not necessarily. I don't know about that. There are two, there are two cases. That's not a problem. Oh, sorry, there's, there's more of a question. There's more of a question. <laughs> there are two cases. There are two cases. One is in the state of New York. Anyone who's watched Billions know that Paul Giamatti is after the president, okay? Um, there, uh, the uh, state of New York wants Trump's financial records to see whether the payoffs made by Michael Cohen to women associated with Trump violated certain financial norms and to investigate that and other stuff. 
And then there is a case in the House Oversight Committee, mm -hmm. which wants the and the, the House Oversight Committee which wants to look at financial records for the same reason. Those two cases are actually merging and are before coming before the Supreme Court very shortly. And uh, if the court accepts it, and then uh, asks, uh, if, if it accepts it in this term, there will be a decision by June. And then, and, and so there's a question of whether, in fact, these are legitimate uh, queries by the state of New York and a committee of Congress, and is the president bound to uh, uh, abide by the subpoenas that have been issued for those records? So we will see. Then the question is, if the court rules with the committee and with the state of New York, does the president uh, obey an order of the Supreme Court? And that, that, that was an issue in U.S. v. Nixon on the tapes and whether he would turn over the tapes to the Congress. Nixon did. And this is where that and matter. That, that was the end. And that, that was, was the end. end. And this is, this is where that matter ends. Um, it if lies. He, if he turns them over, he's found to have evaded it. And he's found to have evaded Then it's a matter for the voters as to whether they want to hold him accountable for the, that, living that life. Okay. All right. Great question to end on because um, yes, those follow the money. Well, and we <laughs> talked about we talked about three branches of government, and and the Supreme Court did play a key role in in the Nixon matter, in in finally forcing the the last compelling piece of evidence out of the hands of the executive and putting it before the legislative branch, and and the Supreme Court is and will. I think have some big gulp moments, some important questions to answer. Um, beginning, um, they're going to hear the, there's an appeal on McGann's that, is appealing. That's that, quite, that was at the federal, a federal court, a district court. It still has to go to the Court of Appeals and then to the Supreme Court. And even if he's ordered to appear, he can appear and say, I claim executive privilege, and then that can be litigated. We will never hear from Dom again. Or, or, or plead the fifth. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so keep hope alive on but, the taxes. But the, but the tax returns is slowly, but that will, that will one way or another be, not necessarily before impeachment, but certainly before the election, I think. Um, so thank you for reminding us about this other body called the judicial branch and, and that they may have a role to play. Mm -hmm. And thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to Charlie, to Garana, to Bruce. Um, if you thank could you, join me and thank you, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you.